Did you know that over 3 million tons of food waste goes into landfills each year? In fact, the EPA estimates that it accounts for 20% of the overall food waste found in municipal landfills. But what if we could transform that huge problem into a resource or even a commodity? Today, we'll be talking to a business who's on a mission to do just that. And even better, their byproducts are black soldier flies and compost. Learn about this business who is trying to make a major impact on the monocropping that leads to animal feed, as well as creating a byproduct of nutrient-rich soil to help restore our farmlands. Right, guys, I am super excited today. If you are a Shark Tank watcher, you might already know who this company is. I have been watching for way too long and I am super excited. I'm just going to go ahead and let him lead in, but I will give you a hint. He is leading the way on changing an industry that hasn't been disrupted for hundreds of years. And instead of commodities crops and feeding chickens all these very expensive subsidized crops, there might be an alternative. So, Michael, tell us more about all the disruption you're causing. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I, if, if folks have seen the Shark Tank episode, uh, my name is, again, Michael Place. I'm the CTO of Chapool Farm. So you've seen a very different human there. That's my partner, Pat, uh, who first went on Shark Tank 12 years ago uh, with Chapool Farms, our company. Um, and we were featured recently a couple in the last two years again. Uh, and we're lucky enough to have uh, quite some support from a few of the sharks uh, in our cap table. But yeah, we are um, black soldier fly farmers. We are insect agriculture entrepreneurs, if you will. Um, and we've been helping to build a, a brand new industry in food and ag that we think is um, extraordinarily powerful in terms of you know copying from nature's playbook and also having the capability of making a big impact and being able to scale, but also being very, very useful for tiny farmers, even uh, smallholder farmers. We do some work in Africa with that. So it's it's a very versatile, uh, very circular, very natural uh, process that we then optimize and make it more efficient so that we can, as you said, try and disrupt a few industries we think need some changes. I think so. I think every single person who said, I'm going to become more self-sufficient, I'm going to buy chickens, and then we realized what chickens eat. <laughs> we ran into all kinds of problems. Yeah. So before we start talking about bugs, we're talking about not bugs for human. We're talking about bugs for livestock. So kind of take me through like the vision, because the vision is not a couple of black soldier flies in your backyard. Tell me about what you guys are going after. Yeah, we're talking many billions. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, when you talk about finding out what chickens eat, um, if you go deep into it and you go all the way back 13,000 years ago in, in Asia where they're supposedly first, you know, insects are an omnipresent resource for all sorts of animals, aquaculture, you got fish that eat them, um, and certainly birds. Uh, it, it sounds obvious once you say it, but I think some of the confusions about bringing insects into the ag world has, has produced a few, uh, yeah, misconceptions at the very least. Um, so they're really, really perfect and they're really, really natural. They also happen to be nature's incredible, voracious recyclers. And so that's how this all started for me a dozen years ago. Um, after over two decades of a sort of a health journey, I used to be a 300 pound teenager. And then, wow. <laughs> you know, food, uh, food turned all that around in a, in a very short time. And then ever since then, you know, whether it's my local farmer's markets or, um, you know, worrying about food waste, getting into the whole food system. So I had a compost pile like many people do. And at one point it got annihilated and I was really confused. I saw an insect in there. I didn't understand. And within a few days, I realized that there was this, um, you know, fairly well understood, I guess. Uh, maybe that's a little premature, but this this bug, the black soldier fly, that really intensely consumes organics waste, and that's what it does. And you know, so I, I call it a youth culture. Um, the insects, you know, the, the adult insects only live for a few days, and they don't bother humans, and they don't eat, and they don't uh, bite or anything like this. They're not very good flyers. The larvae 
uh, literally annihilate all manner of organics waste. So natural materials, even putrefying materials and have for hundreds of millions of years. And we're harnessing that now to both tackle a problem because we've got in this country to name the most notorious problem, 100 million tons of food waste, if we can get our heads around that. Um, and, you know, so tackle that problem with the, the feedstocks coming in. 30% of our landfills are filled with this. It's a terrible, terrible system, if you will, for getting rid of this stuff. And we transform it into what turn out to be some of the most premium, high quality protein or feed in the form of the larva. And then the second and the only other product out of our process is what we call frass, which is the residual poop, excrement, exoskeletons, this this mixture of things that's a really remarkable biofertilizer. So I was that's... about to say, the magic of gardening is the output. Your your byproduct is how to fix soil, right? <laughs> so that's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. that's it's, it's a funny thing, actually, because we're, as a company, really trying to champion this idea that the you know we produce frass in higher volume than the protein um but it's it just hasn't received the attention over the years and so uh it's only beginning to be understood but when you you dig into what it's capable of in various contexts and you have to match that up with the crop and make sure um you know what you're doing you got to test it out but it's extraordinary. It's not only a biofertilizer, it helps battle pests, it helps to restore soils. It's It's got a whole range of, uh, under the hood, it's got a whole range of microbial goodies that do fairly magical things. Um, so we're trying to really propel that to equal standing with the protein, which is what the markets have been more interested in for the early years here. That's crazy. So if we just have our very simple equation. We're going to take landfill waste that we know is producing all these terrible things. It's a global problem. You're going to put it in a system and you're going to output black soldier flies and, you know, amendments to soil. And that's the system. How beautiful is that? Right. Like, <laughs> yeah, we well, thank you, because we feel the same way, obviously. And um, and it really, you know, that's that's the story. You know, that's the easiest way for people to understand this. And if, you know, they don't have to get any fancier um, why there's so many more benefits and why we think it's so much more impactful um, does get quite involved. But that's the basics. I mean, what we're doing is is crazy. Um, you know, we there there's so much cost associated with doing this. There's so much waste. You know, you're not only talking about God awful emissions coming out of these commingled landfills. You're also talking about destruction of the water table. Um, you know, why we did it this way in the first place is somewhat of a mystery. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, you know, without digging too far into that, it's a huge problem. Globally, I believe we're now at about 1.6 billion tons per year of food waste. Which is and then insane. Like it really is. Mind blowing. Well, you know, and you know, we can park the whole logistical part of that where we waste 40 percent and and that's a distribution that's complicated right but, that's that's a big problem but yeah. the end <laughs> right and even if we get better at that whether it's table scraps or or restaurant waste or what have you um it's a massive part of the broader category of organics waste and that has many more uh contributors uh including you know uh on farm waste is a huge there's been a lot of research in the last few years much much bigger than we realized um you know lots of things that can maybe help with that but back to your point about um you know being able to scale this up i mean we are able to harness something here that even though we have concerns about the current industrial agricultural system no one argues that it's currently something that the the world is dependent on and so we can bring a solution that although there may be some risks um, just in terms of supporting something, you know, that we, you know, supporting the industrial system is not our ideal, but we have to go out there and meet the market where it is. And we can do this at very, very substantial scale, as well as at smaller scales for farms and in different, you know, tailored to the bio region or to the community or, or wherever we are. Um, but we can do it uh, in, a, in a very big way to impact these huge problems as we hopefully get better and waste a little bit less. Right. Right. Yeah, I feel like it's always a tough space. You say, I'm not endorsing the industry. I'm just trying to help the problem because the problem is out of control. So I, I like your 
it, it's two in one. We hope that problem doesn't continue, but while it's here, we're going to take it on, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, and there's, there's another layer to that when I think about the soil piece, because, you know, we, we, we have our green revolution where we basically get addicted to oil, 10 hydrocarbon calories to produce a calorie of food. And that equation has been pretty much unchanged for decades and decades. Well, whether it's from energy constraints or or however you look at how that can be, how, the, well, nitrogen runoff, petrochemical fertilizer, all these externalities or simply the supply of, of energy to keep growing for a growing population, one way or another, the buck's going to stop somewhere. And, you know, when you think about the state of our soil, you know, and, and most people, your listeners, I'm pretty sure are not going to be new to soil health. Uh, not going to be new to this, the whole range of ways that you can do that. The imperatives start with no till and just, you got to build back in this, this magic. Well, if we have to do that um, at scale, and if we have to do that quickly, we really don't have any answers for that. I mean, obviously manure is fantastic. Um, you could call our frass uh, specialized manure, if you will. I think that's a, for a lot of people, that's a good way to think about it. Um, but, you know, if we if we have this huge problem we can solve and we can scale and we have an undetermined date on the calendar when we're going to need this soil to be productive without you know pouring oil into it um we think that that, that that's part of what i was referencing before why we want to propel frass to a a much more uh yeah we want we want it to have equal stature to the protein because we think that that's uh it could be even more systemically valuable as the food system hopefully changes very rapidly. Yeah. Well, I was about to say, I, it, so we'll go down each row at a time because they each have such very solid benefits. So take us down the second tier layer benefits of the production of each side, because I, we could get really in the weeds, but let's try to say at least like. <laughs> sure. Onto it. Well, I'll borrow some, you know, some terms from, from industry out there. You know, you've got, uh, what is it? 1.2 billion tons of compound feed out there. Yeah. And, you know, Lots of that soy and corn, but then you've also got all these different additives that go back in to kind of uh, build out lower quality feeds or feeds that aren't designed for those animals that are being fed. And, you know, then you get into the pharmaceutical piece, keeping them healthy in these maddening environments, you know, where they're stuffed in little tiny environments and they get sick. So um, across the board, so, so in that compound feed process, uh, something like this, because it has so many additional benefits, we call it, you know, a functional feed is the way to think about it. So corn, soy, these cheaper things, bulk items, and then you'll, you'll be, most folks will be familiar with fish meal. So that's your premium gold standard out there, um, has its own constraints because we're taking tiny little fish out of the oceans. But in terms of its quality, I mean, it brings this blast of great nutrition and lipids and so you'll see it used even at small inclusion rates with dramatic results you know one two five percent um that's done in in a number of industries uh, even land-based animals some people aren't familiar with that so this is a you know we're, we're bringing the protein we're bringing the macronutrients that everybody you know keys off of when they build their diets and they formulate but then we're bringing some use cases where even in tiny percentages, the protein, the the larva overall is so incredibly valuable. Um, and I'm just speaking nutritionally now. That's kind of the starting point um, that it can replace fish meal. It can replace or exceed the results from soy. You know, that kind of baseline comparison. We've got plenty of data around that, around many species. Um, where it gets really incredible is beyond that rich nutritive blast that you can, you know, and you can use it in much higher inclusion rates. It depends on how you're, you're doing things. Yeah. Um, but then you have all of these immunostimulatory benefits. So yeah. fancy word to say that, you know, we continue to see uh, example after example that this can help reduce pathogens. So we think of it as a circle or a cycle. Um, so waste comes in, the, the insects reduce pathogens that may come in, mycotoxins, a very big problem for a lot of folks. So you're, you're seeing this benefit throughout what we call bioconversion. Then when you feed it to animals, there's all manner of different benefits. One of the ones that I highlight for poultry, uh, necrotic enteritis. It's, it seems to be rising with better poultry practices. So 
you go cage free. Now the, the animals are foraging. You've got a more biodiverse environment they're in and some things that weren't happening in the, you know, large chicken box in, in, in confined environments start to happen. One of them is a pathogen called C. perfringens, which causes necrotic enteritis. The running tally on that is about six and a half billion dollars a year in losses. And black soldier fly, among many other, you know, problematic microbes, knock it out at very, very high levels when you feed it to your animals. Um, so and that comes yeah. back to like biodiversity, right? Like we have a natural system. Yep. When we remove animals from a natural environment, we have to isolate them in a box and they can't let any disease in. Well, now yep. we say, okay, we want to work with nature a little bit. Well, guess what? Disease comes back too. Exactly. I think the feed has to be coming back to natural. Guess what chickens eat? Chickens eat bugs. Like it, it really makes sense to me on a higher level. But I think once we get into that practice, we're like, well, I put them on grass. Why is this yeah. not working with me? Like, <laughs> well. you know, Lauren, it's, it's super refreshing to hear you take the baton there. And, and you know, and I got to keep reminding myself that I don't have to explain the, the basics here. And, you know, we, we have so many um we have so much specialization out there and you just described it perfectly. And this, I think it's, it's really worth digging into a little bit. There's a lot of examples around that where biodiversity is tackling problems that the medical world can't, can't touch and they've tried. And, and so I give the example often of fecal microbiota transplant, you know, which is, you know, this is, we don't know what's happening. We know that we're, we're reintroducing biodiversity into humans uh, oftentimes with lethal superbugs in their body and 90% plus efficacy in getting rid of it. But interestingly, this has been around for 20 years, but you don't see this on the, on the pharmaceutical commercials on the television because number one, it, you know, a precise mechanism is not understood yet when you simply bring everything back to the table and this homeostasis finds its own you know, balance. Oh, are you saying humans? We haven't understood the entire natural cycle and why Ooh. it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've got some work to do there. Um, yeah. <laughs> despite our uh, our fancy gadgets and our our big words, I'm at least sure. we're figuring out it works. Though I guess we'll just yeah. start there. Like, <laughs> yeah, but this is the problem. Your understanding of this was perfect, and we understand something works. You would think that. We would, you know, like any other, you know, build a better mousetrap situation, it would find a home in the market. Um, it's not often that, that linear. And that's, but your, your description was really perfect. It is, it is a biodiversity type situation. Plus, I would say also their evolution is uniquely uh, challenging environments microbially. And so, you know, they're sort of like, you know, you, you give them the worst stuff you can imagine and they're like, hold my beer and boom, <laughs> right. you know. And really, I mean, um, everybody's got difficulty with heavy metals, but after that group of contaminants, um, both, there's a, a long list of man-made and natural uh, compounds, you know, spanning uh, the entire antibiotic, so antibiotic residuals. Yeah. Black soldier fly, wipe them out. Uh, the whole tetracycline class, there's, there's data on this. I mentioned already a, a pathogen that's problematic, but there are many more E. coli, salmonella. Um, you know, it's, it's not, I won't go as far as say it's a complete panacea or a magic bullet, right. but that biodiverse equation is proving over and over and over again, even some residual pesticides and fertilizers, yep. they do not bioaccumulate and they're able to break them down um, with, with the help of their, uh, of their symbiotes with their microbes. Yeah. Um, and it really, you know, almost to the point where we, you know, I carry on a little bit as you can see, but we, we almost have to just pick a few and have conversations because if you're putting the whole case out there, um, it's a little overwhelming, but they okay. really seem to be, it's not just nature's recyclers, they're nature's bioremediators too. Yeah. And, you know, regenerative farmers are going on the internet and buying dung beetles to put into the conventional farms, right? They're like, we know that they have the ability to do cleanup of man-made materials. Like, yeah. how amazing is that? So, yeah. you know, it might just not be this one bug is going to shift every disease and plague we've ever brought. Probably yeah. not. But a good mix of bugs, like, let's let's scale up your operations. Let you diversify into a second type of bug. Let's get the ultimate cocktail of the soil cleaners. Like, you know, yep. I'm excited. <laughs> well, and it's funny, too, <clears throat> because insects have, have been – We've ignored a lot of things, you know, uh, you know, mycology and fungi. We've definitely 
not done our homework there. We're only beginning. But insects, it's even worse, especially in the Western world, because yep. we've had a very deep history where we've been scarred by the association of insects with disease outbreaks and other problems. And then they've been problematic to the way we've scaled our agricultural system. Yep. And so there are these deep, deep aversions that have completely obviously impacted the entire field of entomology, yep. and which is, is changing dramatically. But if you think about the level of sophistication in a dung beetle. Um, I, I, there's a, so I mentioned the African operation. I was on the board with a gentleman from South Africa who grew up with a water diviner teaching him about the natural world. And he mentioned at one point, he said, yeah, he always used to, and he's part of a dung beetle association uh, that, that are helping farmers learn this, to use this technique. And he said, yeah, I was taught that the, they were navigating by the Milky Way. And this was, you know, he's probably in his 50s. Yeah. Well, yeah, apparently awesome. science caught up to this. In 2017, I could share the paper with you. Dung beetles have now been proven to be navigating by the Milky Way in this complex interaction with astral bodies that, you know, gets even hard for me to wrap my head around. But, um, you know, black soldier fly are different, but no different in terms of that level of, of incredible sophistication that insects bring to the table. Um, there's actually wonderful, so natural food for BSF, that's our shorthand, um, or the larva manure is definitely on the list and that's part of our future. Um, but dung beetles in combination, there's a wonderful study, uh, that was done at a feedlot on dung beetles and black soldier fly wiping out, uh, manure much more quickly than, uh, you know, pouring it into a lagoon and, and trying to get some gas out of it. Right. No, yeah, no, not that system. We don't want that system at all. So no. anything else, pretty much. <laughs> but Lauren, that's renewable energy. Mm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been there. It just doesn't. Yeah. It. It's a step. Let's make a better step. Right. <laughs> right. There you so. go. I. I. Uh, I was. I was being a little bit sarcastic. But yeah. <laughs> I was about to say our sarcasm might be a little matched. So sorry for the people who are sarcasm intolerant. We're absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, but I think that's so amazing because we keep saying like the natural world is so much smarter than we are. And there's all these like ancestral lures and we kind of go poo poo. Maybe they don't really exist. And then science somehow when they really get into it, they're like, oh, dumb humans. It has been this way all along, like catch up and learn. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's true. And, and, and there's all sorts of, of uh, perverse incentives out there that unfortunately definitely impact the pillars of science and what's being looked at you know, uh, what's being published, um, you know, uh, who's funding it. And, and, you know, when you think about an open-ended result from a biodiverse, you know, situation, I already mentioned the, the, the one for humans, but black soldier fly are a good example. You know, you're, you're being forced in the, in the, in the marketplace to, you know, drill that down to a few simple points. Hey, here's our protein levels. Great. Check, check. And then, you know, the biggest players in the world are saying, okay, well, when can you be as cheap as soy? You know, can we get that? You know? And <laughs> why is this you know, not done next week? Right. <laughs> right. Because it's expensive and it's complex and we really don't have, we haven't put the kind of, fo you know, I, I like to highlight reductionism a lot um, because even though it's for some people, it may be cliche, it still permeates how we do things. It permeates, you know, where, IP investments are made and capital wants to see that too. Yep. And, you know, you can have a, a functional equivalent that's natural and, and you can't put it into a, a, a tight little IP box and it gets passed over um, because it just isn't in the, in the business model. And, um, you know, we really need to go back and be a little more humble because nature is really offering us up really answers to so many different things that are, um, you know, our biggest problems, if we just pause, look and think a little bit differently, right? Yeah. And I think people have a lot of problem with we want to go to the tech, we want to go to the flashy, we want to go to the sexy. And I'm, I'm hoping that we're on the precipice of nature is now the new sexy, you know, like, <laughs> natural solutions are just continuing to be the answers to the problems we created. So if we can just go back to it, and with those yeah. IPs, like just, maybe we can just slap nature on it and say, okay, look, <laughs> this is better than AI and, you know, precision, all that stuff. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that we're all starting to see the value of this coming around. <laughs> well, and, you know, it brings up an interesting point again, that speaks to our, our journey. And, you know, for example, like I know you're, 
you're in down in Virginia, and uh, can I call that a uh, a regenerative farm, a permaculture farm? Well, which labels would uh would the work you're doing there fit under? Uh, it would America? be a work in progress of chaos. We'll call it a regenerative farm. Wow. But <laughs> no, but that's perfect because I mean that's I think the reality that growers know, and you know, uh, you know, so that makes total sense to me that it's a work in progress and chaotic, but. You know, when I, all these years I mentioned that I've been so concerned about health, I've known that food, you know, kept me out of the doctor's office forever and you know, knock on wood uh, at 52, I feel like I'm still acting about 17 um, because I got lucky early on and had all my, I front loaded all my problems with health to my there teen years. That's the way to do it. <laughs> right. But this, this challenge though of, um, you know, how do we make it exciting? How do we get nature to be sexy? One element, just because of the sheer size of our food system, that we feel we have a almost, you know, a unique responsibility to go big is that this can work at scale and that sometimes growth is what's exciting, yeah. you know, and, and we can understand that, you know, if, if we have a dollar today and we give it to our, our neighbor says he's going to go off and make a deal and give us back two, yeah. great. There's nothing really wrong with that. And so being able to grow, like what you're doing is is complicated, chaotic, and is going to work for your family. And maybe I don't know if you have you know market goals beyond that to help subsidize it. But I think about the idea you know, where, where I would love to be in a, you know, a small permaculture homestead. It's it, it, you know, it gets me out of bed even thinking about it. I have plenty of friends that have made that shift, yep. um, but it isn't something that's going to make a dent. It's kind of like a, a an understandable retreat to worry you know, your own food quality, your own, you know, quality of life, all those come with that package. Yeah. But if we need excitement around things like this, something's got to be able to match the the productivity of what we're doing now. And, you know, again, um, I love this just as much at a small holder farm in Tanzania that uh, got thicker eggshells and more protein in the, in the eggs. Yeah. Um, but uh, practically speaking, to make some change happen, we, we really – uh, need to go out and scale it and get people excited about it. You know, I think you're a perfect time, perfect place kind of conversation because so many people I know came from a health background. I came through a journey of ag because I like almost like didn't make it. I had a serious health issue at 20 years old when my nutrition, my health, like I was actually bed bound for five years with health issues and nutritional healing gave me my health back. The quality oh of your God. food matters, right? And I'm not the only one. I met so many farmers that are this way. So we're like, put our own gas masks on first. I had to create my own food because it didn't exist where I Absolutely. was. And that's so many conversations. So now we're saying, okay, there's so many amazing permaculture, homestead style, small scale farms. That's great. They put on their gas masks and now they're all looking up and saying, okay, what about my neighbor? What about my farther and extended? And I think that's why we're here at this point saying, okay, I've taken care of myself. I've regained my health now the planet. Let's go yeah. big. Like, let's yeah. fix the world. And I just think that personal experience that everybody had to go through, like, we found a real big problem. We didn't need some banner, some advertisements tell us to shift, like something went drastically wrong. Okay, let's take our experience and go help everybody else. So I just feel like that story I just hear over and over again, which is great. because Now we're all motivated. We're all ready to go big. <laughs> yeah, but that, I mean, yours is, is amazing. I mean, five years at that age, you were really, you were bedridden. Yep. Uh, so I was about to say, we'll do a super short aside that I was in college, grad school. I was working three jobs, powerhouse. One day got sick, went down and I moved home with my parents three months later and spent five years having them take care of me. Like mm. went to all the doctors, did everything. Pharmaceutical medicine did nothing for me, you know, and it was natural nutritional healing. Like I can I can list off like five other amazing women farmers that have almost an identical story that women wow. really struggle with nutritional health around a certain age in life. And if we get a disease, could be anyone that compromises right. our nutrition, we can't grow, we can't get better. And those are actually the most actual people I'm seeing is because they said it was awful and it happened to me and I don't want it to happen to any other young women and I don't want anyone to go through that. So kind of like you. Yeah, get those life health absolutely. events done early, like get them over with. And now mm. we're going to go big. <laughs> absolutely. No, I mean, it, and it, it sears it into you. And I, I really believe people can reconnect with, uh, you know, if they live in a city, for example, yeah. one basil plant or tomato plant in their garden, like it, it doesn't have to be a profound life changing health event, but obviously yeah. that sears into you pretty deeply. Cause yeah. I, I really feel like I was on a, a road. You know, I, I ran around at 19 years old with, um, 
two different types of antacids in my car right because i just thought that, that you burned all day long i was huge mm -hmm. was confused i didn't know anything whatsoever about food and how to nourish myself it was yep. pretty and I, the, the craziest thing about it is and I, you know and this really still drives me i thought at that time when i you know over you know throughout the 90s i learned a lot about health obesity the whole the whole food system and i thought we were at some sort of an apex because you know you have some good information you had the internet coming online um but somehow some way it's actually gotten drastically worse we are sitting at 42 percent by 2020 numbers obesity rates mm -hmm. we've got uh what is it a third of kids today born are tracking to get type 2 diabetes these are life-shortening health conditions yeah. that are beyond epidemics i mean they're they're they become a way of life yeah. and now you know folks are talking about we're going to solve this with pharmaceuticals we know that's not going to happen we all know that's not happening yeah. <laughs> it's crazy and but you know it brings me back your your uh personal backstory brings me back to the soil piece because yeah. and I, i'll bet i'm pretty sure you're familiar with zach bush and in, yeah. in the circle yeah yeah so he it, it, early in his journey he he was promoting the right foods right. and uh you know in a in a in a cancer uh context yeah. and he found that things still weren't happening and he didn't understand it and so if you've seen his deeper stuff on gut impermeability and what have you you got two things i wanted to bring up around finding that road back to health yeah. one is the contaminants so he found out you know you may be looking at what you think uh, uh, is what you need and, and you, it is what you need, but if it's been produced in a way that has changed it or left residues on it, you may have a whole nother set of problems and not be able to figure it out. And that produces confusion. It sucks people's energy to change when they try and do, say they're going to go out and eat very differently and it doesn't work and they're still sick. How, what does that do to somebody's ability to, you know, to pick up again and do it again until they get where they need to go. So one, the contaminants, it's a big, big topic. It's totally glossed over out there. It's, yep. you know, and then, but the second piece is just the nutrient density piece alone. Yep. And that's where our FRAS is extremely exciting because it, it hits both of those. If, if we can help you reduce herbicides, pesticides, and petrochemical fertilizers in the right context. Again, it's not a magic bullet, right. but it definitely does all of those things and, and more. Um, but if we can help reduce those inputs and then the proteins heading out and reducing antibiotics in feed, but then back to the soil, the nutrient density that, you know, heading down that soil health journey, you know, no-till starts it off. You get, you know, 65% organic matter in our frass. And now, and we've seen the data now, right? So Gabe Brown and other farms, the information's out there. 49% more magnesium when you're not doing this with this crazy industrial hack to pour oil on dirt is kind of how I sum it up. Um, so those two pieces, I think, are a very big part of why we're so passionate about frass because um, we have to get you know, the contaminants out and the nutrients back in somehow, some way. Absolutely. Because, you know, even on your website, we're talking about soil loss and we're talking about the degradation of American farmland and soil. Well, if we're going down on what we're producing, uh, you know, I think the value is one apple produced in the 80s is the equivalent of eight apples today. We're just losing nutrient content like the value of food is garbage. So not only do I have to go eat an apple, I now have to eat eight to get that nutrient quality up. But guess Crazy. what? If we fix soil... We can go backwards. It's not yeah. the end. We're not using up our resources. We're not clawing our way to the apocalyptic end. We can fix this. Absolutely. And we can fix this like in so many ways, but I obviously am very biased to yours. <laughs> well, but biased, but I think because we have not invested in this, we, we talked about some of the structural reasons why nature doesn't get a, a fair shake in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, I think that we have examples out there that show that it can it can potentially go much, much faster than people even can get their heads around. And, and I'm not saying we have tons of examples because we haven't scaled up a retreat from petrochemical, you know, agriculture before uh, or monocultures. And we haven't rebuilt ecosystems at scale, but we know we, and we have these little snippets 
where it does happen and it sometimes blows our minds how quickly it can actually happen. And, you know, I, I used to follow all sorts of permaculture development around the world and go see these projects go through a three year window. And you wouldn't even, it doesn't, you know, doesn't even like make sense when you see the visuals on this. Yeah. Um, it's happened. Uh, uh, there was a very interesting waste project back in the nineties down in Costa Rica with orange peels yeah. that ran out of money and they left thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of orange peels yeah. and they have you know the imagery is all there this this denuded rainforest the whole country is a rainforest right. but they they literally have like a, a a line where you can go back and see when these researchers dusted off this old project and went back and found the site it was a more lush rainforest yeah. 20 years later than what had been left behind as a waste project um you know back in the 90s and that's it. That's a really, I think that example is everywhere. Um, but again, it's almost like you need a belief in biodiversity. You need a belief in this holism versus reductionism. But if you take the time to stitch together the evidence, that's where I would be putting my money if I'm betting on, uh, you know, being eaten something in 50 years from now, right? Yeah. Well, and I also, again, we're at the beginning of the revolution. Those small, amazing yeah. farmers are doing it and they're proving it. We're seeing the, you know, topsoil coming back. Like yeah. our, our grandfathers knew that that was possible. And then there's just like, you know, a hundred years in between where something very catastrophically went wrong. But anyway, after that, we're now going, look, we can, and we're yeah. proving. And so now we're saying, okay, technology, how can you help us scale this solution? And I think that's really like the golden age. If this is how we're doing it badly, yeah. how amazing is it going to be when we're doing it well, right? Yeah. Like when yeah. we figure out that scale. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, that, that really is it. If we take, so, we have so many tools, if we can set the right foundation for what we're going to do with them, yeah. um, putting technology in a, in a complementary role, not as this religion that we're worshiping to feed us like the Jetsons, uh, you're a little young for that, but. No, you know, I was about to say, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm <laughs> talking the technology that raises the, uh, the cow uh, gate so that they can be rotationally grazed without human. That's the kind of technology. Amen. I like. <laughs> Amen. Kudos to Joel Salatin and, uh, and our friend down at Oak Pasture. I forget his name. Oh, Will Harris. Yeah. My buddy. Yeah. yeah. He's brilliant. <laughs> he is brilliant. Have you met him? I have not met him in person. Oh. I was about to say, I, I've spent a lot of Zoom calls with him, but that man's nice. fine. He he spends so much time with the farmers that are that second generation of creation and just sure. the, the simple changes that are coming out that make it so that I don't have to go move a fence. Like his rotational grazing is so impactful. So, but anyway, like there's so many cool technology partnerships that are coming out. They're really amazing. So back to like what you're doing is again, a, a technology integration of scale. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about like, you know, it, it's not a bucket in the backyard. Like, tell me how big you guys are going. Yeah. So we are not, um, we're a little bit cautious about this. Um, there is um, a very well-funded uh, uh, colleague of ours in the industry and we participate with them in a, an NSF research body, what have you. Um, but they, they've aligned with some big entities and they're going to go to uh, four figures uh, per day tonnage. So a thousand tons plus a day of wet input. And we're going to be uh, somewhere between 150 and 200 tons is what we think is the sweet spot. While we, you know, because one of the things to remember, and I know this is going to be very, you know, again, self-evident, we're, we're trying to build a biological system, right? Um, it's going to look like a building, Right. And we've got a bunch of trays and a bunch of structure and a bunch of repetitive processes in it. But underneath all that, and that's that's all the engineering and that uh, is part of our story. Um, but it, it's very, very at odds. You know, this is not a machine. These are living organisms. You know, you have a 48 hour difference on inbound feedstocks and you got different microbes. So all those subtleties, we just we know there are some degree of unknowns. We've been doing this a long time. And we work with some of the best people in the industry. Um, and we have, I think, a fantastic team. And so we're ready for 100, 150, and even 200 tons a day. And maybe 500 tons a day if it's co one of our pillars is co-locating yeah. with the waste, right? So shipping this stuff all over the place to build a, a fancy natural garbage can is not we're, – we're trying to put this at the right size for the waste problem where it is. Yeah. And then and then transform it there and limit the transportation. And focus on getting it back in in the bioregion. Um, if that's 500 tons a day down the road, I think it very well could be. 
but I think we don't have a need to go as big as possible with our first large scale facility. Um, and we don't know that a thousand tons a day, well, a thousand tons a day hasn't been proven out. The largest facility in the world's in, in the Netherlands, and that's 300 tons a day, uh, every day, year round. And we're going to be two thirds of that or slightly less for now. And that's, that's plenty because we've got such a, a queue, if you will, of, of opportunities that we can, we can always tweak that upwards when we want to, you know, when we feel confident it's the right thing to do. I always feel it's such a humble answer. No, it, it's not too big. I'm like, but that's so impactful, right? Like that, that is big to me. Like I, I right. think of like the many farmers who have the, we have Tupperware boxes in our backyard and we can do that scale. No, no. Like you're, you're talking massive, amazing changes. So I, I hear the humble scale, but I also think about like, what improvements you can make to the world at that scale. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I, it, it does, it is big, you know, it's not, it's not a, a bucket in the backyard yeah. and, you know, we, we've learned so much. This used to be a three week process for us, even six years ago or seven years ago. Um, we've got that down through manipulation of the feedstocks and through learning how to combine other feedstocks together and optimize that for the insects. We've got this down to six or seven days now um, in a single feeding. We used to do multiple feedings. And so there's all these these innovations along the way where we're definitely ready to scale uh, as an industry and, and as a company. Um, and yeah, it's it's um, well, and I mentioned the engineering piece. So we we have a very special partnership with our engineering firm who are also not only our partner, but they're, they're our investors. That's Nexus PMG. They've done billions of dollars worth of sustainable infrastructure, not only in North America, but around the world. And so that's who we turn to when we're dealing with essentially waste tech and ag tech um, pre-existing technologies, most of what we do, there's some specialized stuff, but we, you know, modify it for our needs. And then we work with our engineering firm to put that into our design so that it's highly efficient. And then again, when we go back to focusing on the biology, um, yeah, that's amazing. so yeah, it's, uh, it's a neat, it's a neat team we've got built together here at this point. I think it's a very neat team. I, I always appreciate that you guys really bring that holistic context or regenerative mindset to everything. You're not just, yeah, we're putting 16 billion giant things across the United States. Like, you know, we're doing what fits the context of where we are and what's needed at the time. And it just, it's all very regenerative, right? <laughs> it is. And, but then bring it back to that context. Like I've been, watching the food system as i mentioned for decades and i'll, I'll put the question to you because you've obviously been paying attention a long time because you transformed your life um but in the last four years do you well let me let me ask this as less of a leading question what period have you seen the most rapid change in the food and ag system in in your time paying attention to it i i mean so i've been very hyper focused in the last five years but i would say we're at the precipice of the newest light and excitement i feel like now Maybe yeah. that's just because I'm new in this space, but I feel like we are, again, golden opportunity of we all started acknowledging the change. Technology is here. Innovation is here. Now there's money, right? Yeah. So there's all this context about climate action and moving down. And now nature can be somewhat funded. So I feel like it's now, but call me optimistic. Well, <laughs> agreed. I think the table is set. But where I was going was, you know, one of the, we, we define the broken, the food system is broken, right? <laughs> and And that's, you know, not what you're executing on. That's the sort of day to day and in, in yeah. uh, at scale. And then you know we also borrowed a line from Robin O'Brien that it's I think fundamentally even more important is you can't fix a broken food system with a broken financial system. And so the turmoil of the last four years in all the years I've been watching things happen, I have never seen a, a greater pace of change. So take volatility on pricing, fertilizer. Um, you know, take volatility on pricing you know, that was already happening in, let's say, egg prices. Then you throw in inflation, right? And by the way, the fertilizer prices were going crazy before Russia and Ukraine in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And so price volatility, um, the expanding recognition that the food system is broken and externalizing a great deal of harm, whether it's to human health or waterways, yeah. it, it feels like there's this convergence and there's a lot of, of change going on. So what is the perfect context for us? Well, we're, you know, I come from the blinding change pace from digital tech, we're trying to stay very nimble and ready for uh, hopefully what I think is a necessary shrinking back towards, um, 
you know, smaller scale, for example, in livestock, you know, operations like what you're doing, I think, have continued to be robust. We sell substantial product into the backyard chicken market. Um, and we mentioned a bit about poultry, but in addition to some nasty pathogens, um, the birds eating black soldier fly cease feather pecking. Um, you know, I mentioned the protein and, and a lot of the data there about better quality eggs. So tons of benefits um, that in, in those niche markets that aren't driving the, the big pillars of ag, but I don't know, you know, where they're going to be. I've never seen these kinds of pressures out there, um, you know, at the commodity pricing levels, energy prices. So we'll see. Uh, those are catalysts of change. I mean, I know they, they also hurt people, but so I'm not trying to be gleeful about the disruption, but we think we need to be ready uh, to address a food system that may not look anything like this in 10 years. Okay. Well, I, I think you're in good company that we're happy for disruption. We're, we're happy that there might be a future where farmers don't live in volatility of price structure that, you know, it isn't so scary that, or maybe farmers can be paid a living wage because of a shift, God forbid, yeah, right? Like, absolutely, right. <laughs> so that's where we might be a little happy for disruption in a certain context, of course. Um, absolutely. Well, you bring up something really powerful that I, I wanted to share. So yeah. we're, um, I'm not sure if we're in public comment phase yet. So we're a part of a grant uh, proposal through USDA with another unique organization that's been focused on food waste for a long time. And we just got some really tremendous feedback and gave a lot more information to them. But what we're talking about is a pretty sizable grant to work with five individual farms in a smaller design model that we've worked on for years. Ooh. So it's very different than 150 to 200 tons a day. It's designed for that farm right? Uh, and it's it's a buttoned up, it's not a turnkey system because we're going to have to train these folks to, to operate this and understand some of the nuances, but we can produce the, the larva, right? The eggs, and we can ship those in. So that's the hardest part of what we do. And then they have this little bioconversion engine and they can produce feed and fertilizer. And we can also do a landscape assessment and pull in from their operation or the local community to balance out what their waste is to bring in a few other ingredients that make it highly efficient. And so we are incredibly excited about doing this uh, with these individual growers, you know, they all have a little bit different, they're around the country, but this is a whole nother opportunity for this to take off. Um, and that's obviously something that can grow even faster than 150 ton a day facility. Yeah. And um, so we're, we're really thrilled about that because I think that kind of taps us into what you're feeling and being a part of is this smaller scale change at the farm level yep. for folks who want a living wage. They want, you know, yes, they care about the planet, what have you, but there have been so many pressures on farmers to do it all and without the right resources or compensation. And we think this can be a great tool um, and produce better quality outputs once it's in motion, right? Not just swap out an ingredient for something that feels good because it's sustainable, but it can improve what they're producing. Right. So not uh, corn and soy is now replaced by quinoa and uh, berries. I don't know. Like right, <laughs> we're not right. changing one problem for a different one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I defer, by the way, when, when you talk about shifting fields to different crops, that's that is where I humbly listen to what growers uh, are trying to do with their soil and how they might do that. It's That's farmer life. expertise, right? We, we don't go there. The farmers know right. that are there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Do you um, have uh, anything that we haven't touched on? Because I feel like we've covered a lot of good things. Any like big impact statements? Any, any good big finishes? Because, man, we covered it. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it really we, we we joke a lot internally about having too many good things to talk about. So I you know I'm not interested in being overwhelming. I, I just kind of go back to uh, our entire True North has been that this is a natural system. You know we got to plug in a few machines to do it at 150 tons a day, and we can bring it on down to a, a shipping container size to put it on a farm. Um, we we have huge opportunities once we start. You know. Uh, growing more rapidly in the food and ag space. We didn't talk about wastewater biosolids and contaminated manures that may have very problematic uh, antibiotic residues in there. Black soldier fly do amazing things with both, but we can't put that back into feed markets right now. So that we consider to be R&D. But it really, if you, if you step it back to the waste side, the beginning, 
um, composting, which we think is absolutely fantastic, of course, and AD, anaerobic digestion, are your two pillars to deal with organics waste at a systemic level. We feel we belong in that third pillar. Um, and we think that we have a lot more benefits. And again, not to besmirch composting, but for speed and for NIMBY concerns and everything else, we think that this is something that can be much more impactful uh, around cities, for example, and in, in different niches as we grow, you know, alongside composting. But, you know, I really feel this is something that could become a household name. And when it gets better understood, like you said, a lot of people think we're out here trying to feed the world bugs. We're trying to feed aquaculture. Pet is a huge market for us. They're they're paying an enormous amount trying to beat out aquaculture to take all of our product. Um, but backyard chickens, poultry at scale, cage free, uh, all of this biodiversity helps the health of the animal. That you know, just really your touch points: animal welfare, uh, better nutrition, better health, less dependence on fixing health with a pill or a shot for the animals, because we know that's very harmful. And then of course, reducing all the, the runoff and nitrogen when we get to the biofertilizer. So we think it's a beautiful, uh, multifaceted regenerative value proposition. And um, we are interested to talk to growers who think they might want to use it on their farms, um, do trials, even if they are you know uh, large or small, there's many, many animals we didn't talk about that have been fed BSFL very successfully. And um, we're just trying to get the word out. We think education is a big part of what we do too. Um, and yeah, you mentioned too, we, we have, so we have a, a corporate, uh, you know, foundation for what we do. That's our hold co uh, out in Oregon. We have our innovation center in McMinnville. We're on a 700 acre regenerative farm. Uh, we're co-located with the soil food web, who many of your listeners will be familiar with Elaine Ingham. Um, so we're doing some research trials out there with local farmers, and that's kind of our our home, if you will. Um, then we have this development model where we're setting up these projects and building them out. But the the hold co and the, and the core, our team and our know how and our innovation, um, we're raising ten million dollars right now in a Series A that's actually available as a crowd fund for folks who are accredited um, and are interested in joining the joining the fund. So we uh, we like to put that out there because we'd love to democratize investment too. We think that the crowdfunded via Main Street is better way to go than a lot of the VCs and private equity uh, capital sources out there. So if if people are trying to help spur on innovation, then give us a call or check out your pool farms on the web. We're definitely, uh, we think we're a good bet. I think you're a great bet. And I think, you know, whether you're a creditor, or whether you want to be part of this, like you guys offer so many different ways that people can get involved. So like, yeah. you know, if anybody is drawn to this, like reach out, you guys are doing amazing work. And I feel like more brilliant minds together makes more innovation and makes more change. And I love yeah. it. Well, Lauren, I'm going to throw one more out there when you bring it back to farmers, you know, and I'm not trying to put us out of business. We've worked very hard and we, we, we definitely know what we're doing, but this is something that people can look at for their own farms and they don't have to necessarily uh, go out and get a PhD in this. Now it does take some careful management and it can get smelly and messy and not work, but you know, there's no question that this is highly viable. If farmers are, are looking at this and especially if they're pretty handy and they're that, you know, they can do different, you know, polymathic types who like to just figure stuff out. You know, this is better if you're in a warmer cli climate cause you can do it year round, but it maps to the seasons that, that most folks are using more feed and so take a look at it. It's it's pretty extraordinary and, and it, it's accessible uh, at small scale. If you're going to try and put something together that's very efficient, uh, that's going to take a long time to learn how to make sure you don't have uh, troubles. But it's it's worth checking out. It can be – you can – let like, a, like my honeybees, sometimes I wonder if I'm a beekeeper because if I leave them alone, Sometimes they do just as well as any of the you know help I give them, and <laughs> you can you can go out and find black soldier fly. If you put a pile of waste together, they're almost always going to pop up and be a part of the mix. Yeah. So you just manage that a little bit, and folks can leverage this uh, on their own if they're interested in learning more about it. I, I think 
a lot of farmers that are already doing it small scale could really draw inspiration of your ability to scale. So yeah, not trying to put you out of business too, but there's some no. pretty smart farmers out there that I think could be good friends. No doubt. <laughs> to the system. No doubt. And I don't think we're going to run out of waste anytime soon. So I'm not real worried about all that. You don't have to fight <laughs> over that. <laughs> exactly. So, Hey, well, I'd love to, uh, to see the farm sometime down in Virginia. I, uh, I know of another guy down there doing amazing things with horse manure and people marvel at his soil, but, uh, it sounds like, uh, it sounds very interesting and exciting. I, I, you know, that you jumped in with both feet with Eric and getting it done down there. Yeah. Well, I was about to say every, every good farmer comes from a very inspiring reason to get it done and to right. stay out there every day. So I was about to say, we would be happy to have you anytime. Come show you the chaos and the, the experiments. <laughs> Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, Lauren. You have a great day.